Hello, I'm Stefan Schwartz. This is Schwartz Report, and I want to welcome you again. This is uh, the, we're beginning the first one. Today, we're going to talk about three things that I see really happening in the United States, which concern me a great deal, and I think should concern you as well. As I said in the opening, Schwartz Report is entirely fact-based. I'm not into political partisanship. I'm not into philosophies. I'm not into ideologies. What I care about and what this program is going to be about is fostering well-being. Things that do foster well-being and things that degrade well-being. So today I want to talk about consciousness, artificial intelligence, and the weaponization of lies. And I say this because I am increasingly concerned that a large percentage of the American public simply don't live in a reality-based world. They live in a world that is created by the deliberate manufacturing of lies. So let me get started with that. Uh, again, I at the end of the program, I will put up a link that you can go to to get the information that I am using in the program itself. Again, I stress, this is all fact-based. When you think about it and you follow up on it, uh, I hope you will see why I feel so strongly that we have a major trend going on that is a real problem. If you look at what's going on in social media, you see again and again stories about misinformation. Now, the idea of misinformation is, is not new. Uh, the oldest example of misinformation being used for a political purpose that I can find is 3,000 years ago in, the, in Babylon uh, involving a Noah story, um, the flood. But um, this, these sorts of things have been going on throughout human history. There is, however, a difference. And that's what I want to get into, because this difference, which is social media and the Internet, has changed misinformation from something a guy starts as a rumor in a bar or somebody shouts from a corner uh, in, a, in a square, a market square, to something where you can inf infect and impact literally millions of people. And why is it so powerful? That's what I asked myself in the research that I began doing. And the answer, I think, is fear. Fear and a part of our neuroanatomy that you never hear anybody talk about on media, uh, the amygdala. Uh, as you will see in the, in the slide here, a search on the term emotional brain fear and the amygdala produces an astonishing 4,953 results at the National Library of Medicine and they all support the single hypothesis, the amygdala is the prime factor in processing human fear. Now, why does this matter? The amygdala is a little gland about the size of an almond in your brain. And it is involved with fight or flight. And it's extremely well known in the neurosciences. As I said, that over 4,500 uh, examples of published peer-reviewed papers, but you never hear anybody talk about it in the media. The amygdala is important because it hijacks control of a person's ability to respond rationally to threat. This then leads the, to a person reacting in an intense emotional way that may be out of proportion to the situation and without uh, the ability to use their frontal lobes a person is not able to think clearly. This is the critical part of this issue. What is happening is that 
about 27% of the population have overactive amygdalas. That is, they are easily stimulated into, into flight or fright, uh, of fear or flight. And the other thing that is going on in this country is that we are becoming a majority minority country. By 2040, 2045, we will be a majority minority country. That is, there will be no dominant race in the United States. Now that may seem like, uh, okay, who cares? But to a lot of people, it means a great deal. And it has got them completely freaked out and producing enormous resentment and grievances because this is happening. We now have a level of racism going on in the United States that I thought we would never see again. I went to hear Martin Luther King give the I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial. And I thought as I was walking down Constitution Avenue to get there and looked at all the people that were walking with me, the thousands and thousands of people, I thought, finally, we've come to an end of this kind of racism that has been baked into the country from the very beginning. And then the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act 65. I thought, it's over. This kind of racism has finally ended. But it has not, as you know from looking at the media almost any day you like, you see it over and over again at a level that has not been seen in 40 years. And it is because the manipulation of misinformation. The, the fact is, not a happy fact, that most Americans don't really have a very good understanding of how their government works. I mean, a third of the people in a poll that was done by the Annenberg Public Policy Center, about a third of the people could not name the three branches of government. I mean, think about that for a minute. A third of the country can't even tell you the three branches of government. Now, also, about a third have these overactive right amygdalas. And the third thing is that the average IQ in the United States is 98. And 34% of the population are between 98 and 85. So you have about a third of the country that have low IQ. You have about a third of the country that really don't understand how the government works at all. And you have about a third of the country who have overactive right amygdalas. And then you add to that the weaponization of lies, which is, I mean, if you think about it, quite extraordinary. Uh, I cannot remember any time in the past where a large part of the population, again, about a third, really lived in sort of reality too. Studies that done by the Center for the Countering of Digital Hate, I mean, think about it, There's, they're actually this has become a subject of intense academic study, this business of, of uh, social media being used to propagate hate. About 60% of 13 to 17 year olds who were surveyed agreed with four of the most harmful conspiracy statements. So you have children who increasingly are being indoctrinated in such a way that they can't recognize actual reality from this conspiracy reality. 49% of adults can't do this. They also live in reality too. And for teens who spent four or more hours a day on any single media, uh, up on the social media, that figure goes as high as 69%. So nearly two thirds of young people are being corrupted by a form of misinformation that is purveyed 
through uh, the media without anybody really fully understanding sort of what's going on. And I want to illustrate by uh, using COVID that we have just gone through for the last three years and aren't still aren't out of, but I want to use COVID as an example of how incredibly powerful this can be and the effects that it can produce. If you look at the data, and again, this is all based on factual data. This is not political partisanship. This is not about trying to convince you to vote one way or another. It is a report on what the actuality is. If you look at the vaccination rates for COVID, this pandemic we have just gotten through or are still going through, and you see the enormous difference between the vaccination rate of people who describe themselves as Democrats or as liberals and the people who describe themselves as Republicans or conservatives. And look at the death rate. Since May of 2021, people living in counties that voted heavily for Donald Trump during the last presidential election have been nearly have died at a rate of nearly three times that of people who voted for President Biden. Why did they do this? I mean, we're not talking about one or two deaths. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who basically were manipulated into joining a kind of death cult and who died at a much greater rate three times, depending on which, whether they belong to reality one or reality two. I mean, this is such a powerful effect that as we know, you listen to the news every day, there's still a very large part of the population who believe that the 2020 election was rigged in somehow, that in some way it was dishonest. Despite 63 court cases in, in courts all over the country, Republican judges, Democratic judges, whatever, demonstrating that this, this election, the 2020 election, was a fair, honest election. In fact, maybe the fairest and most honest election held in modern memory. And yet a large part of the population still do not believe that Biden was legitimately elected. I mean, it's kind of amazing, actually. And the other thing that is particularly alarming about this is that with the development of AI, chat GPT, for instance, it is possible to use artificial intelligence to generate misinformation. I just saw a paper that had been published about using a chat GPT uh, and that you, for a cost of about $400 a month, uh, you could set up a misinformation operation which would spew out to just untold numbers of people. The Center for Countering Digital Hate, again, did research on this to see, you know, how many people are doing this and, and uh, how effective is it? And they discovered, I, I just, I could hardly believe this, that 12 people, 12 personalities that they dubbed the disinformation dozen have a combined following of 59 million people across a whole range of social media platforms with Facebook having the largest impact. And they analyzed 812,000 Facebook posts and tweets. Are you ready for this one? I certainly was not and 65% of these misinformation posts came from 12 people. Uh, think about that, 12 people at a cost of about $400 a month are able to completely distort the political environment in the United States and able to distort it in a way 
that resulted in hundreds of thousands of people getting misinformation about a pandemic and basically joining a death cult that cost them their lives. I, I just, it's just very hard to take that aboard. I think we need as a country, we need to begin to think rationally about what's going on in our country and what we need to do to assure that people get accurate information. If you think about this, as I have described, using just COVID, I could have picked a half a dozen other examples of how this misinformation process works. But if you, if you think about it, you can see that at very modest costs, using uh, artificial intelligence programs, that it is possible to completely distort the political environment of a country. Now, if we look at this and we see the election that's coming up in 2024, and there is no effort being made really to control what these people are doing, no way of assuring that anything that you see in media is factually accurate and not being used for some political purpose. How do we prepare for this? It reminded me of the 1919 civil uh, Supreme Court decision in which Oliver Wendell Holmes established the idea that yelling fire in the theater was not protected by the First Amendment. So if you can't yell fire in a theater, how is it that you can electronically on in social media yell fire and have no accountability? I think that as we look at the trends, and Schwartz Report is about trends that are shaping your future. I'm not interested so much in individual events. What I want to look at and what I do look at and, and publish every day in the Schwartz Report is trends. That is not just single events, but recurring events which are shaping our future. And it is clear to me that unless we are prepared and have a Congress that is willing to do something about assuring that what is presented as news information is in fact factually accurate, I see us becoming more and more divided. The biggest trend that I'm looking at right now is what I call the Great Schism Trend. Because if you look at, and I'm going to talk about this in future uh, Schwartz Report podcasts, I'm going to focus on this. But just briefly, if you look at what's going on in this country, you find out that if you look at the social outcome data, again, put aside the politics, the partisanship, all of that kind of stuff. Just look at objectively verifiable social outcome data. What you see incontrovertibly is that Republican governance is always inferior to Democratic governance. Why? The answer is because Republican governance is not about fostering well-being. It's not about improving the well-being of the people in a given state, the legislature, the governor, that's not what they're interested in. They care about power. They care about supporting people that give them large sums of money. We basically have legalized bribery in the United States so that you look at 
uh, any bill that comes up and you see millions and millions of dollars being spent basically to buy Congress people at the state level or at the national level. I mean, we it's a kind of legalized bribery. And because there is a large group of people who have very specific non well-being fostering goals who are using social media to produce the, and, and standard media, corporate media, look, for instance, at what has happened to the Fox propaganda operation and the nearly billion dollar uh, penalty that they were charged. And they still have another $2 billion uh, lawsuit from uh, Smartmatic that's coming along. If you look at that, both in the corporate media that is built for political purposes or in the social media, you see over and over again that it's not about purveying actual information, factually accurate information. And then instead, it's about manipulation. So I would caution you, A, be very careful what you're using as a media source, what informational source you're using. Uh, I publish Schwartz Report every day, and it's based uh, on entirely on factual, objectively verifiable information. And there are other media outlets that do this as well. But you need to be selective in what you listen to, what you watch, what you read. And you need to check to see, is that information actually accurate? Are they telling me the truth? Because it is very easy for people not to tell the truth, to do it quite inexpensively, and to make it possible to distort people's thinking so badly that they act against their own self-interest. You have people literally voting against their own well-being. And if we are going to become the country that we were founded to be, and certainly the founders felt that the principal function of government was to foster well-being. I mean, you have people like Benjamin Franklin, who was the, the only person that signed all three documents that created the United States and who felt so strongly about fostering well-being that he created philanthropy in the United States from private individuals and created a trust fund for Boston and Philadelphia that to this very day is educating young people. Or you look at Andrew Carnegie, a immigrant from Scotland who became one of the richest people in the United States. And the one thing that he decided to do that he really felt so strongly about was to create libraries all over the country, many of which still exist, because he understood that having safe libraries that were fact-based, that would educate people and give them access to information was a critical part of maintaining a functional democracy. We are, I think, at threat of losing our democracy. And if you're listening to this, I ask you, every day you make dozens of little choices. The toothpaste you buy, the toilet paper you buy, the cat food you buy, whatever, the dog food, all these little choices, the gas you buy. Make an effort to find out what these companies are doing. Do they support and foster well-being or are they sources of pollution and degradation of well-being? And when you make a choice, always choose the choice that is the best, the most compassionate, the most life-affirming, and the most fostering of well-being as you understand it at the moment that you make that choice. And you tell 10 friends of yours 
that you're doing this as a discipline and invite them to join you. Now, this is how Gandhi got independence for India without a war. They asked Gandhi right before he was assassinated, how did you get the British? There, a reporter came up from the Times of India to interview him and said, my editor sent me up here to ask a single question. He wanted to know, how did you force the British to leave India? How did you get the British to give up their most prized colonial possession without a war? And Gandhi's answer was, it's not what we did that mattered, although that mattered. It's not what we said that mattered, although it mattered too. But it was the nature of our character, who we were as a people, that led the British to choose to leave India. Think about that, the verb. Force, choose. We are at a place where we are at a position to choose. And if you will do what I am proposing, that what I call the quotidian choice, these daily little mundane choices, and you always choose the ones that are the most compassionate, life-affirming, and fostering of well-being, as you understand it at that moment, you tell 10 people that you have made a discipline of this and invite them to join you. The people that are listening to this podcast, if they will do this, really commit to it, we can change the outcome of the election in 2024 to support and foster well-being. The choice is ours. The question is, what choice will we make? If you like this program, if you like what I said today, if you are a person who cares about fostering well-being, I invite you to subscribe to the podcast. I invite you to su subscribe to the daily publication, SchwartzReport.net. If you subscribe to this and support it, and spread around the information that I am giving you that is fact-based, we can change the country so that it fosters well-being. Please join me in doing this. It is our future, the future of our children and their children. The choice is ours. We need to make it. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.